Okay, let me start with you. Um, the news is that General McChristo uh, is on a plane scheduled to land 4 a.m. Eastern here in Washington. Your thoughts on today's news? I'm saddened and concerned. I'm saddened because I have the great admiration and respect for General McChrystal, who is a, a wonderful leader, and I'm sorry that he finds himself in this situation, but obviously those words were not only unfortunate but inappropriate. I'm concerned that if General McChrystal has to resign, and he may, uh, that what happens to the leadership in the middle of a very crucial time in Afghanistan. As you know, the Kandahar offensive is just beginning and that losing the leader at that time would be very unfortunate. But I, I respect the President's decision as Commander-in-Chief on this situation. Uh, well, we're hearing reports that they, you know, there were speculation that then may by the time we hit air tonight he, he will have uh, resigned. If he doesn't resign, should he be fired? I think that's a decision that the president makes as commander-in-chief. Um, as I say, his remarks were unfortunate. He also has a background of outstanding service to the country. Uh, so uh, I really can't say as to what the president should do. Senator Kyle? I agree. I just hope that when this is resolved, and I suspect it will be resolved quite quickly, We'll get back to the business of trying to win the war in a more unified way than apparently uh, we're doing right now. We all need to be pulling together on this. That means the folks in the field, the commanders, the president, the people in the Congress. It's been a bipartisan effort, and I hope we can return it to that. Can I add one additional point here about my concern? The president has stated and continues to repeat that we'll be leaving uh, in the middle of next year. We cannot win. If our enemies are emboldened by the knowledge that we are leaving no matter what and our friends are discouraged. A lot of Karzai's behavior has got to do with his belief apparently that we may be leaving and he may have to be there to accommodate our friends. Uh, they are beginning to wonder and our enemies are encouraged. The president needs to, uh, to say unequivocally that it is based on conditions. Withdrawal is based on conditions and nothing else, not on an artificial date. So what do we do now, though? I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if we have to, if we have a new general in charge, a new field commander in charge, how, how do we regroup from this? Because, you know, the people in Afghanistan are going to hear this. Our, our enemies are going to hear this. It's not something that we can sort of keep in the family. This is out there that, uh, that General McChrystal has said these things, and he has said very pointed things about the president, even saying that, what, that when he met with him, it felt like a photo op. Well, that's why I said we have to reunify on this. But part of the reunifying is around a common goal. The goal has to be success. And success is not defined by a date. It's defined by the circumstances on the ground. Senator McCain, I believe, is absolutely correct, as he was, by the way, back in the time of the Iraq War when he called for the surge, that we cannot afford to have an arbitrary date that friends and enemies alike view as a certainty that we're going to be leaving, and as a result, they make their accommodations as they need to. The surge seemed to be very successful in Iraq, um, but now, this, in the month of June, we've had more than 1,000 um, American deaths in Afghanistan, and we've now hit the point where this war has lasted longer than the Vietnam War. So what is it going to take to win? I think the strategy is correct. I worry about the diplomatic side. I worry about the relationship between our military leaders and our embassy. I worry about uh, the special envoy, Ambassador Holbrook, and what role he plays in and out. I, I don't see as much of a concerted team effort as we had in Iraq between General Petraeus and Ambassador Ryan Crocker and others. I have not seen that yet. I have great confidence in our military leadership, no matter what it is, and the men and women who are, uh, who are doing the fighting. But I'm very worried about the diplomatic side of this whole situation. But how do we rehabilitate it? That's the problem. And, and I, I, of course, we you know we share your worry. I mean, this is rather a frightening thing to discover today that there apparently has been this dissension between General McChrystal and even uh, and the president, and that there's been some level of belittling by the military leadership of the president of the United States. And maybe the president doesn't have the, the authority with him. I don't know what the situation is, but we have to rehabilitate a situation. How do we do that? The president sets the goals. The president uh, agrees to the strategy and helps devise the strategy. And then you get sufficient uh, 
uh, personnel, equipment, and individuals, both military and civilian, in place in order to ensure success. Um, that also requires cooperation and help from our allies. Um, so we can put a team in place. There are many talented people that can serve this country in an outstanding fashion, but they have to have the right direction and the right commitment from the very top, and that means we will not withdraw until we succeed. Senator Kyle, um, how do you get sort of how do you get the confidence of the American people? I mean, we've got to get the confidence of our military. We've got to send a message on the ground in Afghanistan. But the American people and some are, are queasy on, on whether we should remain in Afghanistan or, or leave Afghanistan. I mean, how how do you regain the confidence of, of the American people that we should stay, assuming that you believe we should stay? It seems to me that they have to be able to answer the question: Is it worth it for another American to die? They have to be able to say there are circumstances in which, for the sake of our country, it is worth it. If they can't say that, then support begins to erode very, very rapidly. And that's the, the problem with the uh, uncertain trumpet that's been sounded here by the automatic withdrawal date. If the president were to come out and say, no, I always intended that to be the beginning, but to be dictated by circumstances on the ground and we will not leave until we've achieved our, our, our mission, then I think uh, the American people will not only rally behind the president, the troops will know what they're fighting for, and our allies will, will uh, perhaps stand a little taller with us, and our enemies uh, are, are going to then have to account for the fact that they can't just wait us out. And the folks in the region will perhaps stop making accommodations with everybody else in the region, figuring that we're going to be gone one day. What is our goal, though? When, when the bombing started on October 7, 2001, we had a, a specific goal, but this is now dried down. And, and we, we pushed al-Qaeda out, I think, into Pakistan, and you know, that's at least what I read. What, what's our goal now? Our goal is very simple, to make sure that Afghanistan is never used as a base for attacks on the United States and our allies again. That requires a stable government, control of the country, and progress towards democracy. The same thing we are seeing in Iraq. And I might point out, things were far worse in Iraq when we started the surge than they are in Afghanistan today. But, but in Iraq, they at least it had some form of government, um, you know, that was not so remotely dissimilar from our own. Afghanistan is a tribal area where they have different tribes and different families. It's a, it's a different. Can, can we do that? Fred, I say with respect, you forget that they, nobody believed that Maliki was anything but terribly weak. We had incredible sectarian violence on a level we don't have in Afghanistan between Sunni and Shia. We had the divisions uh, on the Kurdish uh, border. We had uh, uh, the Iranians uh, uh, playing, uh, sending in the most lethal IEDs. So there was, uh, there was open ethnic strife in Iraq when we started the surge. There's not that in Afghanistan. And yes, there are problems with ethnic divisions, but that doesn't mean that a effective government that really works for the people without corruption wouldn't be supported by every ethnic group. What does that government look like? Does it look anything remotely? I mean, it's Karzai government. He's got a. Uh, they've got a, a, par a functioning parliamentary uh, body, uh, but they've got to make progress against corruption. He's got to show strong leadership, and we have to help build the Iraqi army and police. And that's very tough. It's it's been traditionally very uh, regional based and to some extent tribal based. We're trying to help them create a stronger central government, but there would be undoubtedly a, a strong um, regional and local uh, component here too, perhaps a little bit more than Iraq, which is a more developed country. But I totally agree with, with Senator McCain. It, it can be done, but it won't be done, I think, as long as people see an artificial date, um, which then causes them to have to plan for what happens the day after that date. Counterinsurgency strategy works, and each country and area is different. Iraq is different from Afghanistan, but principles, the fundamental principles actually written by David Petraeus, apply in any counterinsurgency. You just have to tailor it to the particular situation. And again, corruption is a very big problem. Uh, and we, uh, we have to make it clear that progress has to be made in that area. I would also point out that the Afghan army that we have are excellent fighters. We just need a much bigger one. Do we have to worry about morale in our military in light of this rather explosive information today? 
I don't think so. I think that our military is so professional and well-trained. Uh, I think they all admire and respect General McChrystal as I do. But I think overall, I, underst I think they understand the, the mission is greater than the individual. But there's no doubt that he is an outstanding leader. And if the president decides that he's not the right person, then we're going to have to find the right person to lead. Well, the one-on-one -on -one that you had with President Obama, what happened? Well, I, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it. He just told me what he told me, and I accept that. We were talking about the difficulties of moving forward, and one of the things he said was that there are people on his side that uh, uh, believe that uh, if we secure the border, then people on, I think his words were you guys, meaning Republicans, uh, would be less likely to support comprehensive immigration reform, and uh, that that's why they weren't uh, supportive of it. And I said, well, I think we have an obligation, both you and we, to secure the border irrespective of comprehensive immigration reform. And the irony is, if we do secure the border, you're more likely to get comprehensive reform. I was asked at a meeting uh, why I thought they took the position they did, and I said, well, one problem is this, and I uh, articulated it. So, it, what, does it, Is there any indication that there would be bipartisan uh, work on immigration reform? Well, there can always be bipartisan work on immigration reform, but it is very clear that the border is not secure. It can be made secure without comprehensive reform. All we need is, is some additional appropriation for the additional troops and fencing and uh, a jail space and so on, and we can secure the border. And that once the border is secure, then I think there'll be a much more open mind to think about all the different pieces that might uh, form a comprehensive immigration bill. But until it is secure, I don't think the political conditions are there. All right, I use the term war because that's a word that's been tossed around when we've taken trips down to the border in that area. We've even been to Mexico um, with Secretary of State Clinton on, on one of these issues. Um, how bad is it, Senator McCain? It's bad in this respect that there are certain areas of the border that we've made great progress. The Yuma sector of the Arizona border, San Diego, parts of Texas but in other ways that you really hard to put numbers to. It's really gotten worse because of the rise, the dramatic increase in the violence south of our border, the increased effectiveness and murderous, barbaric behavior by these drug cartels, the fact that drug cartels and human smugglers are working together, that's violence that is going on, which is an existential threat to the government of Mexico, has, has really increased, raised the stakes rather dramatically in our requirement to get our border secure. And we have a 10-point plan, John and I, surveillance people and, uh, and the uh, fencing completed or, and replaced where it's need to be, and it, we can secure the border. Senator Kyle, um, one of my colleagues, Adam Housley, had a report today that members of the drug cartels are actually in Arizona and they have sort of staging grounds doing surveillance on, um, on the border and, and to help drugs and anything else come through the state. Have, do you have, have you heard anything like that? Are, are there actually drug cartel people stationed um, in the United States? Yes, what, what people need to realize is what the terrain is like in the southern part of the state. There are a lot of little mountains and then a lot of valleys and riparian areas. And I have been told on several occasions by Border Patrol that yes, the drug cartels put people on top of these mountains. And by the way, part of this is, is on an Indian reservation in which uh, the, the, the tribe there does not want to have a lot of Border Patrol or other people running all around the, the uh, reservation. So they don't like to have the government people stationed anywhere. But the drug people are able to find spots where they can hide out. Both just south of the border, and Senator McCain and I were there Saturday. The Border Patrol pointed out to us, there's a hill. The drug cartel guys are up there right now watching us. And obviously what they figure out is, where is the Border Patrol? And uh, when they leave, now it's safe to, to take our load right on through. So they have sophisticated radio equipment uh, in, in supply, and uh, they have the very, the very best. They, their equipment is as good as, as ours, as the Border Patrol's. President Obama says that they've sent more forces down there, they've spent all this money. What's the problem? 
I think the problem is twofold. One, it's a lack of will to see it through. I mean, you can, you can conduct a war, you can be fighting a war, but not do it effectively. You can spend a lot of money, but not deploy it. Is that what's happening here? Yes, I think so. And then second is the problem of resources themselves. But with the expenditure of relatively small amount of resources, I think we can achieve what we need. President Obama is the one who has the authority, ultimate authority. But why, what happens when you tell him? If I could just take a run at that. Uh, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, we have asked both Attorney General Holder and Homeland Security Secretary Napolitano for the plan to do what we just talked about. How much will it cost? What do we need to do? For a year and a half, we didn't get the information. For, for a year, we didn't get it, so we passed a law saying that we wanted the information by December 27th of last year. We still await that information from these two government departments. What do they say when you call over and say, where is it? I mean, especially with the uh, Homeland Security uh, Secretary, Janet Napolitano, she used to be your governor. Well, and uh, I understand from her department that they're waiting uh, to get it from the Attorney General's office. Who's waiting to get it from the Department of Homeland Security, who's waiting to get it from the White House, who's waiting. Uh, there, there's another point here. The deputy head of the Border Patrol said the area down near our border is like a third world country. Our citizens should not be condemned to living in an area of the United States of America that's quote, like a third world country, unprotected. Yeah. unprotected. And there are signs up. When the next time you hear someone say, well, the border is, quote, more secure, whatever that means, then why does the federal government have to put up signs that I think you took pictures of that says, warning, this is a drug smuggling and human smuggling area, be careful, et cetera, et cetera. And Those are put up by the government along to the warn route our citizens. And not on the border. North of our border. North of the border on Route 8, is that? Uh, yes, near, just south of Route 8, north of our border. So you can understand why people who live there would feel this insecurity, which is translated, very frankly, when Rob Krentz, the rancher, was murdered, into anger. John and I, Saturday, were there, and people are very angry. And they have, we watch people with tears in their eyes talking about this situation. It's very moving. So what do you tell President, I mean, do you get a chance to talk to President Obama about this? I realize that you've got the Secretary um, uh, Napolitano and Attorney General Holder going back and forth, but what about President Obama? John was with him recently. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I think there's a view that they want to do it through the mechanism of comprehensive reform. Politically, comprehensive reform isn't going to happen anytime soon, certainly not until the border is secure. So in effect, they set up an impossible condition. Now, they will say also, well, we are still putting resources against this. We're trying. And our only argument is we understand what needs to be done. You need to employ those resources smartly the way that the people on the border believe that they should be uh, employed. And if you do that, we can secure the border, but it's not being done right now. You can understand the frustration of the American people is that, you know, we sit and we, we listen to this and we know the border's insecure. We've, we've heard that over and over and we've seen, you know, some of us have even seen the signs where it says beware. Some of us have read about, you know, the horrible violence. Some of us have heard about people being stuffed in, you know, trucks and, and boiling to death in the heat. We've all seen that. But then we sit and, and the people we send to Washington, you know, work this out. You know, help us. You know, how, how do we get everyone to work this out for us? It's a matter of federal policy. It's, it's the president saying to the director of Homeland Security and the attorney general, get it secure. How much money do you need? Maybe a couple of billion dollars? That's probably all that's necessary. Look at where it has worked. San Diego, Del Rio, Texas, Yuma, Arizona. What are they doing there that works? Do the same thing in the Tucson sector. How's Governor Brewer doing? She's doing fine. She's been standing up for our state, and that, of course, brings up the issue that we found out on Ecuadorian television about that the fact that the Attorney General is going to bring suit against the state of Arizona. And I, I watch Ecuadorian television a lot. I just must have missed that one. Uh, rather than notify the governor of Arizona, which is a courtesy that I think should have been extended to her, we find out on Ecuadorian television. And apparently the suit is going to be about whether the state of Arizona has the jurisdiction over this issue or not. The state of Arizona would never would have acted if it hadn't have been for their frustration over the lack of the federal government carrying out its responsibilities. And of course you got the boycotts. Well, hopefully... Uh 
people have calmed down a little bit and realized that if you call for a boycott in, in, on business, doing business in Arizona, you're probably going to hurt the very folks that you'd like to try to help. These are folks that are, are at middle income at best, who have jobs in our tourism industry, for example, or in our construction industry, and they're the ones that would be hurt by a boycott. So that makes no sense whatsoever. By the way, I wish those people who talk about a boycott would read the Arizona law. Senators, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.